Okay, good morning. Uh, this is Leon Platanis. I want to welcome everyone uh, to today's uh, Grand Round. We have uh, three great speakers uh, here today. And uh, the way we will do it is each of them will give their presentation. Uh, during the presentations, you can email questions. Uh, we have, um, you can see the address where to email questions on the screen right now, cancer at northwestern.edu. And uh, after they all finish, we will take the questions that will come to me and I will be asking them. Please remember to, uh, to get CME credit. Uh, you can dial 312-957-8301. And the text number, you can see it on the screen, is 56774. So uh, the, the topic today is obviously COVID and cancer. COVID has had a you know, significant effect on all of us, especially for cancer patients. And we are very pleased uh, to start with uh, Dr. Mike Eisen. Uh, everybody knows Mike well. He's professor of uh, inf medicine, infectious disease, and surgery, and uh, runs our infectious disease program in uh, organ transplantation. Uh, Mike uh, does extensive uh, clinical uh, research on infections on transplant recipients and viral infections, and he has done uh, great work uh, on COVID. So, uh, Mike, uh, we can start. Thank you. Wonderful. So, uh, what, what I thought I would do this morning is just give you a very brief overview with a focus on vaccine and uh, therapeutic options that are coming down the pike. Uh, Mike will uh, then focus us on uh, uh, the specifics of uh, COVID on cancer patients, and then uh, Mary will uh, uh, continue on uh, <clears throat> with a focus on uh, what we're doing here at uh, Northwestern. Next slide. Here are my disclosures. In addition to these, I want to thank the Cancer Center to support a convalescent uh, serum uh, biobank that's uh, being developed and will enroll our first patient today. Next slide. Um, so we all are uh, familiar with the uh, range of clinical presentation of uh, COVID-19. Um, <clears throat> uh, and this is really uh, a, a range of illnesses uh, from asymptomatic disease uh, to severe disease uh, requiring ICU level care. The actual uh, uh, proportion of these uh, blocks is uh, probably not accurately demonstrated here. There's uh, likely a very sizable asymptomatic population, particularly in uh, uh, young uh, adults and children. Uh, and may be important uh, in the uh, development of disease in uh, other populations. Next slide. Uh, our understanding of uh, uh, mortality and the clinical presentation of uh, disease really is driven significantly by which part of the uh, pyramid we're testing in our uh, clinical paradigm. Uh, and here are two international examples, uh, the UK being a little bit closer to what we've done here in the United States. Germany, they've had a very broad testing uh, algorithm where they uh, take pretty much anyone with uh, symptoms. Uh, and as a result, their denominator is much larger, making their mortality rate uh, look lower, when in fact, the, the tip of the pyramid is likely uh, a, a similar actual proportion of the overall uh, patient population getting sick. If you look at how we do things in the United States uh, and in the UK, we're really uh, focusing on those patients that are coming into the hospital and so really overestimating uh, potential uh, mortality um, by not detecting, uh, by testing uh, the, the lower uh, portion of uh, patients. On the right hand side, uh, you can see two different countries. Uh, Iceland, which is essentially testing everyone in the country, and the Netherlands, which has a much more US-like uh, restricted uh, testing approach. And what you can see is this also gives us a slightly different picture of who has the infection. The Icelandic approach really shows uh, a, a huge proportion of patients, mostly with asymptomatic or mild disease in younger age groups, um, whereas if you focus on the uh, more severely ill, you're going to get a more skewed uh, uh, impression that there's uh, a higher proportion of older adults uh, that are uh, being affected, again, because you're looking only at a small proportion of the overall patient uh, population. Next slide. 
And this really, uh, I think, uh, uh, drives us to uh, uh, realize that although we have described the, the clinical syndrome of uh, COVID-19, there's probably a range of, of uh, diseases, uh, uh, disease severities that we're seeing. And as uh, we'll hear in a few minutes, uh, this uh, may be important in immunosuppressed populations such as those in uh, cancer. Um, most patients with COVID-19 will have fever, a dry cough, fatigue, oftentimes with uh, severe myalgias as well. Um, sometimes people just have mild uh, disorders with atypical symptoms like GI distress uh, or diarrhea uh, that either predates or is the sole uh, presentation of uh, disease. As patients get sicker, they have higher fevers, they uh, have more shortness of breath, uh, and they appear to have some markers of uh, end-stage organ disease with a decrement in the uh, white blood cell count, particularly the lymphocyte count, uh, as well as evidence of end organ uh, damage with elevation of LFTs uh, and kidney failure. Uh, we need uh, a number of different uh, uh, ways of uh, making uh, the clinical diagnosis. This can either be made uh, based on clinical syndrome, imaging uh, uh, patients with uh, uh, disease in the, the lung that can be uh, typically uh, bilateral and involving both lung fields or uh, limited to uh, <clears throat> just a, a local pneumonia less frequently. These patients may have other biomarkers suggesting uh, inflammation uh, in the patients out of proportion for the, the clinical disease. Next slide. Um, we all know uh, the, the impact of uh, COVID-19 globally, and I think we're just starting to see signals in developing parts of the world, Africa and South America, where testing is really in, inefficient uh, and uh, likely uh, we'll only understand the impact when we look at uh, excess mortality in these locations. Next slide. Unfortunately, Chicago is one of the areas that's uh, more heavily impacted by COVID-19. Uh, and uh, looking at the numbers lately, uh, we still have uh, a fair number of uh, uh, clinical uh, illnesses uh, uh, and new admissions to the hospital. So at best, uh, we're getting close to the, the top of the curve, uh, but haven't started coming back down. Next slide. Um, importantly, though, uh, case rates are still increasing uh, in this area, and this is a heat map as of a couple of days ago, looking at areas uh, where there's uh, an increase in the rate. And I think the troublesome thing is it's not just Chicago, it's other areas around the Chicagoland area. Uh, and as we know, there's a lot of movement of people from different areas, even um, in an, an era where we're not having a lot of movement. Uh, and uh, this uh, raises the concern of continued uh, imports uh, to our region. Next slide. Uh, looking uh, at more granular uh, Illinois data, um, you can see, not surprisingly, because of the concentration of uh, healthcare settings uh, and likely testing, uh, there's uh, a focus of infection predominantly in the more urban, more urban areas around Chicago, uh, the southern Illinois uh, region around St. Louis, and the, the, the larger cities such as uh, Peoria and Springfield. Uh, you can see kind of the breakdown of uh, cases uh, in uh, the uh, uh, state of Illinois, uh, where you see a large proportion of orange and brown uh, blocks, uh, particularly in the younger age uh, population, which uh, represent uh, African American uh, and Hispanic populations, a, a factor that's been uh, recognized not just in Illinois as an overrepresented uh, population uh, in the uh, uh, cases uh, in the state. Next slide. Uh, thankfully, uh, we didn't become overwhelmed. Uh, this is a, a snapshot of uh, state uh, resources as of a few days ago. While uh, we have uh, some of our smaller hospitals uh, more significantly impacted and at more uh, uh, higher rates of utilization. Um, thankfully, most of the academic medical centers have done very well. And if you look at the uh, uh, bar graphs over time on the right, you can see that most of the uh, hospital bed, most of the hospitals have excess beds, excess ICU uh, beds and ventilators. Uh, so thankfully we aren't yet uh, and hopefully will never become overwhelmed by COVID-19. Next slide. Um, and I think we've done a very good job of uh, flattening the curve, something everyone has heard about. Um, and really the goal of this was to do exactly as what we're seeing. We're actually squashing down the number of cases and spreading them out over time so that our healthcare uh, setting isn't overwhelmed. Next slide. Um, this does have a, uh, a, a range of uh, impacts. 
Um, the data on the lower right shows uh, very granular data in uh, Seattle where they show um, geolocation that came from Facebook as people uh, did stay home, the rate of secondary transmissions markedly reduced over time, proving that uh, social distancing does work. Uh, the downside is, is that uh, it uh, basically lengthens the period of time that we're in a, uh, a, a uh, wave of uh, this disease. And that's why initial, uh, initially they were expecting uh, us to be out of the wave. Now it looks like it's going to extend through a good chunk of the month of uh, May, maybe into June. Next slide. Um, and this is a demonstration for mortality rate. And again, you can see uh, a much broader than what was initially predicted uh, curve of uh, mortality in the state. Uh, and again, that uh, tail uh, extending out through a good chunk of the month of May. Uh, next slide. Now, let's uh, change our attention to other ways that we can prevent uh, disease, and that is uh, uh, through the use of uh, vaccine. Um, I think that really the exciting thing uh, with uh, the approach to vaccine is that there was very early on uh, data looking at the uh, uh, areas that were conserved between SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, uh, where we have a vaccine and we understand a fair amount about uh, vaccine development. Uh, and thankfully, a lot of the uh, epitopes uh, that are um, uh, critical for vaccine development for SARS-CoV-1 are conserved uh, and allow us to uh, directly apply uh, lessons uh, from prior vaccine development. As a result, a range of uh, vaccines are undergoing uh, development. A lot of the vaccines that are moving uh, forward most quickly are using a very novel approach uh, in which you use RNA uh, or DNA that's delivered in one of a number of different ways to uh, basically transfect uh, human cells. Those cells then produce uh, proteins from SARS-CoV-2 on the cell surface, uh, allowing uh, kind of continued uh, uh, delivery of uh, antigen. This will hopefully uh, allow just a single administration of these vaccines, uh, since you have persistent expression of the protein over a period of time, uh, uh, to allow uh, the, the need to uh, do the prime boost uh, with one uh, vaccine. They also have the advantage of being highly scalable and easily changeable. So if we cha find that they, we need a different segment of the uh, protein expressed to get better uh, uh, responses, we can just edit the, the uh, segment and, and uh, uh, introduce it into the vaccine. It can be scaled up very quickly. Uh, and most estimates suggest that uh, production capacity could uh, deliver the goal of 300 million vaccines under a short period of time um, uh, with uh, existing technologies. The downside with these is we don't have licensed vaccines yet that utilize these uh, approaches. Uh, and so uh, critical safety and efficacy questions um, uh, will uh, potentially remain, especially since there's not a long-term uh, experience uh, with the use of these vaccines. Likewise, I do suspect that the general public will uh, be a little bit anxious about using these vaccines, given the undercurrent of uh, concern for vaccines uh, that don't introduce new genes into an individual uh, and uh, concern over things uh, such as uh, GMO uh, foods. There are some traditional vaccines that use uh, either proteins or, or uh, uh, inactivated viruses. These are uh, moving along a little bit more slowly. Um, I will highlight the Sanofi GSK uh, uh, collaborative uh, group. That is the vaccine uh, that we will likely have uh, here at Northwestern uh, for clinical uh, trials. Next slide. So there's been a lot of talk, particularly over the last day of this uh, project Warp Speed to get uh, a vaccine moved forward. I hope it's uh, uh, closer to truth uh, than uh, a lot of the hyperbole that we've uh, heard uh, previously. But again, I think we really have to put this uh, in place with uh, where other vaccines have been developed. Um, and these are years, not months. Uh, so most of the vaccines take decades to uh, move from uh, initial concept to development, uh, particularly uh, when you have things uh, and concerns such as antibody-mediated enhancement that may actually make vaccinated patients uh, have worse disease. Uh, next slide. And again, the, there's the reference to yesterday's New York Times article, which really, I think, talks through a lot of these issues in uh, great languages, and I actually like their uh, imaging. Um, and, uh, you know, basically, as they outlined, a typical vaccine takes a long period of time. You have oftentimes preclinical work happening and being completed before you move into phase one. 
each of the phases is completed, data analyzed before moving on to the next uh, phase. And then factories are only built uh, for those uh, vaccines that make it to the finish line because there's a huge number of uh, vaccines, particularly in early development, that just don't make it. Um, what they're proposing uh, with uh, this uh, project Warp Speed is a lot of overlapping. And we're seeing this where the preclinical work and the phase one trials are going on concurrently. This has the benefit of speeding things up if things go smoothly, but if there's signals that come up um, uh, in the preclinical uh, phase, we may have to do additional uh, uh, phase one studies to address those before moving into uh, phase two. Linked to this risk uh, is that there's overlapping. So you can see that phase two are starting as phase ones are wrapping up. Um, as you've seen the preliminary data, only not the uh, full uh, data set uh, to analyze. And the plan two is to continue uh, this into phase three, where you start phase three almost concurrently with uh, phase uh, two. The other challenge with uh, phase three is you have to have a population that's uh, uh, being exposed to the virus to understand the vaccine efficacy in preventing infection uh, and if this uh, virus uh, peters out uh, uh, for a period of time, uh, it may be challenging to conduct these uh, trials. And it's led to some, in my opinion, ethically concerning uh, proposals of doing human challenge uh, models with a, a virus that we have limited uh, therapeutic efficacy and unpredictable mortality. Probably the biggest uh, uh, thing that has been uh, implemented uh, in this uh, project, Warp Speed, is that there are incentives being given to the companies to actually start uh, building uh, uh, factories and uh, production capacity uh, at the same time that they're moving into phase two. Uh, this will allow them to start producing vaccine in large quantities as soon as they start getting uh, clear signals. Uh, and then of course, FDA, like uh, uh, with a number of uh, the drugs, is really uh, working very closely uh, with uh, companies to move things along as quickly as possible. Next slide. Um, so in the last couple of minutes, let's uh, turn our attention to uh, potential uh, management uh, strategies. Uh, this is a, a great graphic uh, from a, a recent uh, article that looks at the different potential locations where we can impact uh, the replication or clinical course of disease. Um, there are two approaches that can be used uh, uh, with uh, regard to uh, blocking entry of the virus. You can use antibodies either through plasma or monoclonal antibodies to block that entry step. You can use drugs that either impact uh, the ACE2 receptor uh, or TMPR uh, SS2, a co-receptor that is required to bring the virus uh, into the cell. There are a number of drugs that may have impacts on this uh, endocytosis steps, um, but again, I think uh, uh, we need to uh, take them a little bit uh, with a, a grain of uh, uncertainty until we get clear clinical uh, signals uh, for these. Uh, the virus is then released, uh, uh, releases the RNA and is translocated uh, into the nucleus where replication occurs. And this is where direct, direct acting antivirals uh, have an impact. Remdesivir, which we'll talk about in a, in a second, uh, uh, works at this step, as does an, another drug that will enter clinical trials in the near future, favipravir, uh, that impact RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. A coronavirus is somewhat unique, unlike other uh, viruses that we're used to using these uh, polymerase inhibitors, in that it has an endonuclease uh, proofreading step and so can cut out uh, other uh, uh, nucleoside, nucleotide analogs. And so only a limited number of drugs will be able to overcome this uh, and move forward. Uh, once the virus uh, replication is ongoing, there's production of a large number of uh, inflammatory cytokines. And then this is where the second phase of uh, uh, drugs uh, in terms of treatment are coming in. And these are those that are blocking this inflammatory uh, cascade and hoping to uh, mitigate some of the uh, severe disease uh, that we're uh, seeing uh, in these patients. Next slide. Um, so I'm really going to focus on remdesivir uh, for our discussion today. Uh, it's an IV uh, formulation of a uh, prodrug that uh, is uh, converted into uh, a potent inhibitor of RNA-dependent RNA polymerases. It's active against a wide range of uh, pathogens, including SARS-CoV-2 at clinically achievable levels. Um, one potential challenge is uh, that resistance uh, may develop uh, relatively quickly. Thankfully, most of the resistant variants uh, are still sensitive to higher concentrations of remdesivir, and the majority of the ones that have been identified to date uh, um, are less fit and so may not replicate uh, very effectively. Currently, it's only available as an IV formulation and likely will remain so, and uses cyclodextran, uh, which has some uh, toxicity, uh, renal toxicity uh, potential uh, uh, for uh, the, the uh, drug. Uh, 
Uh, known, uh, LFT, known side effects include elevated uh, LFTs, uh, change in PT, PTT, GI side effects, uh, and headaches. Next slide. Um, so we got kind of somewhat uh, uh, divergent uh, data all in the same day, uh, two days ago, when the uh, Chinese study uh, was released uh, and uh, published in The Lancet. Um, but this comes with a lot of caveats. The design of this study was it was a two-to-one randomization uh, in a double-blind placebo-controlled uh, multicenter approach. Unfortunately, the goal was to enroll five, or sorry, 453 patients, but they only enrolled three, 237 because they just didn't have any more cases showing up to the hospital. And as such, we have to recognize that there is a major caveat that this is significantly an underpowered study. Uh, we do see some separation of the curves uh, uh, in terms of uh, primary endpoint clinical improvement with remdesivir showing uh, a clear uh, signal later on uh, for improvement, but this wasn't statistically significant. Um, the virology, though, is a little bit concerning in that there did not appear to be a uh, significant difference in uh, virology um, over time in, in patients, whether collected in the upper or lower respiratory tract. Um, again, whether this is a small sample size uh, or not, uh, we'll have to see. We still don't have this data from the NIH trial, uh, and so something that we'll have to learn. And again, maybe the virus that's there is uh, resistant virus and not replicating as well, and that's why we're starting to see some of this clinical uh, uh, benefit. Uh, it was important to, to note that there was uh, a more rapid clinical improvement in those patients that had been started uh, within 10 days of symptom onset, although it wasn't statistically significant in approach. So, uh, and again, aligns well with some of the data that uh, we're seeing out of the NIH trial. Next uh, slide. Um, from a safety standpoint, uh, basically no new safety signals were identified. Next slide. Uh, and then we got top level uh, uh, data out of the uh, NIH adaptive trial. The goal was to enroll 572 uh, patients. The DSMB allowed over enrollment. Uh, so they enrolled nearly double that, 1,063 patients. It was randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion with a loading dose of remdesivir uh, followed by uh, BID dosing for 10 days. Um, time to recovery uh, was the primary endpoint that was used in this, which was day of recovery defined as uh, uh, basically the top three tiers of uh, uh, clinical care. The reason why this was changed from the original endpoint was that uh, uh, the lopinavir ritonavir data showed some significant limitations of the ordinal scale as originally planned, and, and this uh, sec sec second uh, endpoint was uh, selected before uh, the study was uh, far along uh, and without looking at the data from the study. What did they find in top level results? There was a reduction by about four days of time to recovery uh, that was statistically significant as well as a, a trend towards slower mortality. Again, a lot of subgroup analyses are ongoing uh, and uh, uh, I think everyone's looking forward to uh, seeing the full details, but really some clear signs that this uh, drug uh, appears to have benefit uh, for uh, patients, particularly those that required oxygen at uh, enrollment. Next slide. So I'll turn it over to Mike uh, to take us through the, the, the information on uh, cancer. Yeah, let me before, uh, uh, I just wanted to remind everyone to send questions in between. And I want to briefly introduce Mike. Uh, Mike is Assistant Professor of Medicine and Medical Education with a clinical interest in HIV infection and other uh, infections. And we're really glad he's here. Go ahead, Mike. Here. Okay, there we go. All right. Uh, thank you for having me this morning. Thanks, Mike, for kind of the introduction to uh, SARS uh, CoV 2 and COVID. I'm going to specifically talk about uh, uh, COVID 19 in persons with cancer. Um, next slide. And so, what is known about COVID in persons with cancer? So, there's a lot of limited uh, data, limited information about uh, this uh, infection in persons with cancer. There's obvious concerns when we think of other infections about higher rates of infection, worse outcomes uh, as a transmission events in the hospital or other healthcare environments, uh, and then concerns, especially for your patient population, uh, in regards to the management of chemotherapy uh, during the SARS CoV 2 pandemic. Next slide. Uh, so when we look at the incidence of uh, COVID-19 in patients with cancer, uh, most of this is based off of case series data. Uh, this is one of the earlier case series that was uh, presented out of Wuhan um, in one of the hospitals that looks specifically at the incidence of 
uh, COVID-19 in their cancer patients. So they looked at about 520 cancer patients and 12 of their patients um, developed infection with uh, SARS coronavirus 2. Um, and that was an incidence of about 0.8%, uh, which was higher than what the general population incidence was in Wuhan, which was around 0.4%. The median age was 66 for this population, um, and most of their uh, uh, patients that developed this uh, infection had non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, again, small numbers, uh, but most of their patients had non-small cell lung cancer. Next slide. Uh, so what about the prevalence? So this is a study that looked at all of the uh, case series that have re been reporting on just patients in general. Uh, again, most of these out of China and they extracted uh, the cases of uh, cancer patients having uh, COVID-19. Uh, they broke the group into two. So those uh, reports that had populations under 100 patients and those that had populations over 100 patients. Um, in the smaller population uh, uh, evaluation, uh, the uh, prevalence rate was around 3%. In the higher population, over 100 uh, patients reported uh, the prevalence was around 2%. Overall, the prevalence of this infection in patients with, with cancer was around 2%, which again was close to twice as high as what was seen in the general population that were listed inside of these um, uh, uh, case series. Next slide. So I think the most important thing is how is this infection and how is this illness actually presenting in individuals um, with uh, uh, cancer um, and how is it different in patients with cancer versus those without. This was a recently uh, published paper uh, looking specifically at just over 100 persons um, with cancer uh, at 14 hospitals in Wuhan and compared uh, the presentation and the outcomes in these patients uh, to patients without cancer. Most notably, what was found was that patients with cancer experienced more in-hospital infections, they had a higher smoking history, and they had a higher observed death rate, ICU admission, and need for mechanical ventilation. So overall, having a much higher severity of illness with this infection. When they looked at their symptoms, there was really no difference in symptoms uh, in cancer patients than those without. They still had fever, cough, shortness of breath, sore throat, and fatigue, which was very similar to what was seen in individuals without cancer. When looking at just the specific outcomes and especially the severe outcomes, we can see in this uh, figure that individuals with cancer had higher rates of severe disease, including ICU death and need for invasive ventilation. Next slide. Looking specifically at symptoms, this is a small study uh, that just looked at the symptomatology of uh, COVID in individuals with cancer. Again, highlighting what uh, uh, Mike described, fever, cough, fatigue, dyspnea. So those typical respiratory, upper respiratory, lower respiratory symptoms that we would think of with this infection and other respiratory viral infections. Indeed, these patients also had myalgias, diarrhea, chest pain, other non-traditional um, uh, or non-major uh, symptoms, but there was no single symptom that uh, was different than the general population that uh, uh, came out in patients with cancer. And so again, our patients are seeing uh, or developing similar symptoms to what the population without cancer are presenting with. Next slide. Going back to um, uh, the more recent study looking at the outcomes of individuals with cancer. What was nice about this study is they broke it up for the different malignancy types as well as different therapies that patients received. The caveat I'll say for both of these figures and these analyses is that the numbers are small as you start to break up uh, the population. But I think what's really important if you look at uh, the graph on the, the figure on the left is that patients with hematologic malignancy and lung malignancy uh, fared much worse than individuals with other forms of cancer, although all uh, cancer types uh, um, had much more or were higher risk for severe disease compared to individuals without cancer, um, especially when looking at uh, the different therapies. So immune therapy, surgical therapy, chemotherapy, those individuals had a higher risk of severe disease and death compared to individuals um, uh, without any cancer. Next slide. Uh, for progression of disease, so this is one of the earliest uh, reports, again, of only 18 patients with uh, COVID and cancer. 
uh, but they tried to look at these patients compared to the general population. And again, just kind of reinforcing that the overall progression of disease, the more severe disease was much higher in individuals with active or even a history of cancer uh, as, as seen in uh, the two figures that are uh, on the slide here, as well as looking at the hazard ra uh, ratio for um, COVID in patients with cancer being much higher than in the general population. So a hazard ratio of around 3.5. Next slide. And then mortality itself. So the, the outcome uh, of most concern and what we're really worried about with this infection. Uh, this is from the WHO China report. Uh, so just looking at the experience in China, what happened, different patient populations. Uh, when looking at patients with cancer, the mortality rate was around 7.6%. Um, this was much higher than the overall mortality of around 3.8% and a lot higher than the mortality in individuals with no comorbidities, which was around 1.4%. And very comparable to the mortality in individuals with chronic respiratory disease, hypertension, and diabetes. Um, those with cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular comorbidities uh, still have much higher mortality rates, uh, even in this WHO China report. Next slide. Uh, and then uh, the other factor is chemotherapy. There's not much out there about uh, chemotherapy in COVID. Uh, can we still give it? Should we initiate it? When to restart it? Uh, this again is a small uh, series of patients uh, uh, from uh, China, so 28 cancer patients, looking at um, when those patients were receiving chemotherapy relative to their diagnosis of COVID. And they split the group into those that received the chemotherapy either less than four, 14 days, less than or equal to 14 days from their diagnosis of COVID or more than 14 days from their uh, diagnosis of COVID. And those that were receiving care, chemotherapy proximal to their diagnosis of COVID uh, actually were at a much higher risk of developing severe disease. Again, that's ICU admission, mechanical ventilation, or death than those individuals that were receiving chemotherapy more than 14 days from their diagnosis. Next slide. And so all this brings up, how do we start recommending uh, chemotherapy, continuing chemotherapy? What do we do for our patients with cancer? Um, and if you look at uh, all the guideline agencies and the national uh, agencies like ASCO and ASH and the bone marrow agencies, I'm part of the uh, NCCN uh, guideline committee uh, and recommendation committee for infections. Um, it's really hard to make any assessment. And most of this is based off of opinion, uh, based off experience with other respiratory viruses. And what we really want to do is we want to, we worry that the chemotherapy and immune therapy furthers the immune suppression and risk for serious complications in cancer patients. Um, and we're really promoting that interrupting anti-cancer anti treatment should be really uh, strongly considered. Now we know that that's a really tough um, uh, decision to make with our patients. Um, uh, and we have to have that discussion with our patients. If patients can forgo chemotherapy for a few weeks, a few months, uh, or they can get chemotherapy that is not as immune suppressing or uh, uh, ablative, uh, then we should try to see if we can go with another chemotherapy. For individuals who get diagnosed with uh, COVID-19, uh, we need to reinitiate or uh, uh, start chemotherapy. Um, we should wait until those symptoms have resolved and we have certainty that the virus is no longer present. Uh, and that typically means getting a negative SARS-CoV-2 test. If the cancer is rapidly progressive and we need to give chemotherapy, the risk of their cancer progressing uh, um, uh, is, is, is such a concern and they, we know they're gonna get benefit from that chemo, then we should proceed with treatment. But we need to talk to the patient. We need to understand what uh, uh, those outcomes may be. Next slide. Um, and so looking at uh, uh, COVID in, can in patients with cancer, they have similar presentation. The preval prevalence of uh, SARS-CoV-2 is uh, much higher. Uh, the outcomes appear to be worse, more severe disease, ICU admission, mechanical ventilation, and death. And it may be higher based on, uh, the severity of the disease may be higher based on the cancer type and the therapy received. Next slide. And at Northwestern, what we're trying to do is look at how do we get these patients back into care once they've been diagnosed with COVID or we think that they have COVID based off of their symptomatology. Maybe they haven't had a positive test. Um, and so this is patients with hemalignancy, solid cancers, 
uh, active chemotherapy, stem cell transplant, immune therapy. We want to test them in order to clear them so that we can bring them back to the center and not worry about uh, exposure of other patients, healthcare uh, uh, workers uh, to COVID. Um, and for that testing, we need to get uh, uh, repeat uh, SARS-CoV-2 PCR. Usually we're wanting two negative tests greater than 24 hours apart. The testing should be done three days after symptom resolution and seven days after the initial test. If we can't do that, then we have to clinically clear them. Um, and because these patients are at much higher risk for persistent uh, PCR positivity, uh, the flag uh, and the isolation procedures are gonna remain in place for 40 days uh, at least. And this comes from uh, data uh, specifically on patients just in general being positive for up to 35 uh, days uh, on PCR testing. Um, in discussions with other cancer centers uh, out in Washington and New York, they're seeing patients that are PCR positive 40 days after their initial diagnosis or longer. Um, and so we really need to uh, uh, be mindful that these patients may be PCR positive for a while. Next slide. Then we look at when to restart or initiate chemotherapy. So as I mentioned, uh, treatment should be delayed if we can, but sometimes we can't do that. We need to get someone back into chemotherapy. We need to get them their therapy because they're within that window that we need to treat their cancer. Um, and so some of the guidance that we've been working on is for those with hematologic malignancies who have a diagnosis of COVID, uh, we should wait until they've had resolution of their symptoms for 14 days. And we should try to get those two negative uh, COVID PCRs. For solid organ cancers, um, we should wait for seven days after resolution of symptoms and those two negative uh, COVID PCRs uh, to try to get them back into uh, chemotherapy and restart their chemotherapy. As I mentioned, the PCRs can stay positive for a very long time. And I'm not sure how many of our patients are really going to be negative at 14 or seven or 21 days after their symptoms resolve. And so we may have to give chemotherapy to patients who are still uh, shedding virus or still PCR positive. And in those instances, we have to weigh that risk benefit uh, calculus. We have to do the chemotherapy with appropriate PPE for healthcare providers, for the patient in settings where that PPE can be provided and in settings where we can protect other healthcare providers, but most importantly, other uh, patients that are coming in for their chemotherapy that do not have COVID. All right, and with that, I think next slide, and I think Mary is up. Yeah, and everybody knows Mary, of course. She's Assistant <laughs> Director for Clinical Operations in the Cancer Center, a GI investigator, has made huge contributions to the clinical operations of the Cancer Center. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. So um, good morning, everybody. I'm going to talk about, uh, just gonna make some quick comments. This won't be very long. Uh, trying to apply what we've just heard uh, to our clinical care. Can you go to the next? So these, we have to base this in facts. Every change that we're making in the cancer center is based on the facts that we have at the moment, at the time. So we know that there's person to person spread, especially within six feet through respiratory droplets. We know that a person um, can, after touching a surface that has virus on it and then touching their face, that they can possibly spread virus. We have already heard about and we are familiar with the signs and symptoms of COVID-19. And we know that older adults, those with underlying health conditions and those with compromised immune systems are at greater risk of developing serious illness from the symptoms from the virus. We also know that these symptoms can here two to 14 days after exposure to the virus. So there's um, a little latency period. Next. Uh, and we know that what we could do to prevent spread of coronavirus and to protect ourselves. Washing hands, avoid touching your face, and avoid close contact with people who are sick. We know that distancing prevents spread, surgical masks prevent from droplet exposure, and N95 masks protect from aerosolized exposure. And we also know that sandy wipes kill virus on surfaces. So with these facts, a number of changes were made to our clinical care. Next. So the focus is on containment. We know that the virus is out there. We need to try and contain it. Um, and the changes that we've made in the cancer center are focusing on this containment aspect. So we need to allow for social distancing. 
And if you recall a few months ago, um, anybody who walked through the uh, waiting room in Galtra 21, there was no social distancing, but uh, changes were made. We instituted the no visitor policy. Um, we delayed visits that can safely be delayed, incorporating telehealth when it's appropriate to limit the number of people coming through the cancer center, and also adjusted therapy to minimize in-person visits. People were were continued on oral therapy. Some therapies were spread out. People were given a break. Um, and I just want to give a call out. The FDA recently accelerated approval of pembrolizumab on a six-week regimen. And we're going to be talking about that uh, offline, um, what to do with our patients that are on pembrolizumab. So that's an attempt to decrease the number of in-person visits. Um, we're screening for symptoms or exposure uh, from with a call the night before and then in person. Anybody who presents with viral or viral symptoms or any fever is isolated on presentation. We're practicing universal masking of patients and staff. We cleared all the space of any non-essential services, the paper off the exam tables, any paper in the exam rooms. Um, and, and then the biggest impact has been the testing and retesting for clearance, which we'll talk about. Next. So the CDC, you already heard some of this. The CDC recommend clearance for immunocompromised host um, with, the following with the following parameters. So resolution of fever without any use of any fever reducing medications and improvement in respiratory symptoms and a negative test um, for COVID-19 times two greater than 24 hours apart. So we know the test isn't perfect. So there's a confirmatory test 24 hours later. So this, um, we needed to set some more guidelines for this. When do we test? What's the appropriate time? And we actually agreed to test the first patient really not sooner than seven days from resolution of symptoms. Uh, the guidelines actually just on the CDC site for non-immunocompromised hosts just changed again last night. They're now recommending clearing people 10 days after. So um, they base their timelines on the time of infection. And we decided, we felt that patients would probably not be ready for treatment for seven days after resolution of symptoms. So these are guidelines, this is not absolute, um, but seven days after resolution of symptoms, patients have their first COVID test to demonstrate clearance and then a confirmatory test 24 hours. For um, hematologic malignancies, because as we know, virus, it takes longer to clear virus, uh, the first test is done at 14 days after resolution of symptoms. And then we talked, you already heard about this clinical care clearance. 40 days after infection, patients were felt to be clinically cleared without testing. Next. So what don't we know about the immunocompromised host? This is the short list. We don't know how long this virus hangs around. We don't know what the transmission risk of those without symptoms, but with persistent positive tests. We don't know what the factors are that lead to the prolonged infection. We suspect hematologic malignancies seem to lead to a prolonged infection, but what other factors? Is it related to the intensity of their illness, to the duration of their symptoms? It's not known. We don't know what the risk of reactivation of the virus is. If um, for patients that do proceed with chemotherapy, what's the risk of reactivation? We don't know the risk of transmission in these pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic hosts that are showing up in our clinics. And we don't know if there's gonna be any effect of antivirals in eradicating this prolonged infection like other viruses that we see in the transplant um, population. Next. So here's what we've done um, at the Cancer Center. So using these parameters, testing people uh, with two tests greater than 24 hours apart, we're trying to get confidence that the people coming into the Cancer Center are cleared of their virus give people the confidence that they can delay treatment and will have an endpoint for when they can resume therapy. Or if they need to resume therapy sooner, we just have to be prepared for it. So for patients that need to return to the cancer center for care within 40 days, where mandating testing clearance is needed. So right now we currently have 14 patients that we're tracking. And the, this is not all the patients with cancer. These are patients that um, need to come back for therapy, that we need to get back in the cancer center. So we've got 14 patients that are COVID positive on cancer therapy. Five of them have breast cancer, two have lymphoma, and then there's one each with Kaposi's sarcoma, myeloma, lung, colon, breast, esophagus, and stomach. 
And when I saw this, I saw quite a few GI cancers. I think one of the biggest issue there is that we don't have a lot of oral therapy to treat these cancers. So these are people that we need to get back in for their infusion therapy. So of these 14, we've had seven of them have had at least one test for clearance. The other seven either still have symptoms, they were just diagnosed, or they're waiting until it's closer to their infusion date to be cleared. Out of these seven, we've had one negative, and it was 25 days after her infection. She hadn't been tested before that, so we don't know exactly when she cleared, but at 25 days, we have one negative. We've had four positives, and these range from 11 to 37 days after infection. And then there's been two indeterminate. An indeterminate is treated as a positive, um, and the two indeterminates are 16 and 38 days after infection. The one patient that's 38 days after infection with an indeterminate actually had a positive result and then an indeterminate result, and then a week later had a positive result, and now a week later is back to indeterminate. So this, um, I'm sure you're all realizing, this gives us a little bit of angst about this 40-day mark that we've set, and we need to continue to monitor this and to, uh, we'll be making adjustments as we go. Next. So, um, there's a plan across the whole institution. Now that we have some containment uh, measures in place, we have testing in place, we need to try and, and get patients back into the uh, institution as well as in, in the cancer center. They're already seeing an increase in uh, patients in the ER with non-COVID related illness. So uh, people have been delayed in their medical care for a while and now they're starting to come back and we need to make accommodations for that. So there's a big system-wide reactivation strategy uh, based on these guiding principles that we need to ensure safety for all the patients and the NM team members. We need to maintain readiness for another COVID-19 resurgence if that were to occur. We need to prepare all of the operational leaders in all departments of clinical care, our radiology, the operating rooms, everybody with the process and the data to be able to op reopen their clinics to reactivate based on, with a, with a measured approach. We need to focus on the wellness of our physicians and our caregivers. And I added in here also our patients. Cancer is a very isolating illness as it is. And I think a lot of our patients have really struggled through this time in uh, not having the support around them that we know benefits these patients. And the fun part, we need to identify the lessons learned and emerging best practices, develop new technologies and new tools that we can, uh, continue to develop uh, to proceed with better care for our patients and our staff. Next. So we need to prepare to care, oh, what rhymes, prepare to care for patients with COVID. Um, we are going to be seeing this. You just heard there's not going to be a vaccine for a while. Patients have COVID. They still need to um, get the care that they need. These patients will, uh, these patients will recover from their COVID illness and we need to continue to focus on treating their cancer. And I think the biggest thing is that we need to respect these unknowns. I, there was a long list of unknowns. We don't know how long this is transmittable and what the degree is. So we need to keep that in mind as we prepare to bring these patients back into the cancer center. We need to practice based on science. Um, we need to be using appropriate PPE. And um, as we stated, this is, this is droplet in the, if you are maintaining distancing and wearing masks, this is spread through droplets. So using appropriate PPE for droplet transmission. Uh, we need to address the processes according to the science and the data. As I put this together last night and I was seeing that these numbers are getting out to 40 days still with positive tests, we may need to make some changes in who we are um, bringing back to the cancer center at 40 days with a, with a clinical clearance. We need to continue to delay patients if we can, if it's not to their detriment. As I said, they'll be cured of their COVID. We don't want them to succumb to their cancer if, if, we, do, if we can avoid that. So delay patients, as, continue to delay patients as we can, but we do need to prepare to bring patients safely back into the cancer center or into the institution to resume or continue their care. And there's been a lot of work going into this, how to safely do this. And when we say safely, we mean safely for our staff as well as for um, our other patients in the cancer center. Next. So this is just um, 
a chart of just a framework to think about how do we bring patients back to the cancer center. Um, <clears throat> they divide, they, you, if you think about your patients in three groups, there's patients that are already receiving inpatient care, patients that have been delayed and now need to get back into the cancer center, and patients that can potentially still be managed with um, televisits and um, a delay in their surveillance. And this will be a phased in approach. So pretty soon, um, this is dated next week, but it'll be a bit of a ramp up. We will slowly start bringing patients back um, that sit in this group B category. Those patients that are symptomatic have been delayed and now need to start coming back to the cancer center. And depending on how this goes, um, keeping this measured and uh, at a slow pace, at some point we will be bringing back our routine patients. But I don't think it's gonna be the same as it was. Can you go to the next? So uh, there'll be some changes. And some of these changes are actually things that we were working on prior to COVID. Some things that we were trying to bring into our cancer center as we've been talking about the redesign. And a lot of it is technology based. The temperature scanning technology that uh, we're all going through as we enter the, the hospital um, is something that we would like to have in the cancer center, have patients getting off the elevator and having their temperature scan and being able to pull them out and not, and get their uh, vital signs taken and be evaluated quickly. There's technology that's being used by the COVID triage team, which is reaching patients that are at risk. They're, they're geriatric patients out in the community that are at risk for COVID. And it's a, it's a really nice technology that they've been working on and they just activated it a lot sooner given the COVID pandemic. So taking advantage of some of that, uh, those lessons learned. Telehealth, we hope is here to stay. The current telehealth um, allowance is based on the CARES Act, and that is in effect as long as there's a public health emergency. So for now, what we're doing is we're trying to reach out to the appropriate people to see what we need to do to make telehealth a permanent part of our patient care. This allows distancing. It, it allows patients to stay out of the cancer center that don't need to be there, so there's room for the, pa for the patients that do need to be seen in person. It's convenient to the patients. It improves access. People are able to get their evaluations sooner um, without having to come to the cancer center. It improves clinic flow and decreases wait time, uh, which is not having wait time, those one hour and two hour wait times that were reported before are not happening. This can facilitate clinical trial enrollment. We're reaching out to patients to assess for uh, eligibility for clinical trials, get the studies started, can be facilitated with telehealth. And it certainly facilitates system-wide collaboration, consultations, and care. Um, I can tell you that our partners out in uh, the North and in the West, they are loving this opportunity for patients to have a consultation um, with one of the specialists downtown. Those new workflows have been developed to limit ED visits, and those uh, we need to continue. There is a neutropenic fever directed MIT guideline that we're continuing to work on and try to make this sustainable. We'd like to see the oncology triage clinic expansion so that we can keep patients out of the emergency room. And I think these video conferences, although um, there's many of us have a love-hate relationship with them, it does improve engagement across the system. There's 278 people on this video conference. We've never had that at Grand Rounds. There's, um, we can institute system-wide tumor boards, which uh, we've run into so many barriers with trying to do this, but uh, we're doing it out of necessity and we can continue to increase our, um, our collaboration. Uh, and I think that's it. So um, I just wanna thank everybody. Everyone's been very patient and understanding and helpful. And uh, I've learned a lot from everyone who has either had experience with this sort of pandemic before or, um, or even just knows people and has been very helpful. So thank you. So thank you, Mary, and thank uh, to all our speakers for uh, he being here. As Mary mentioned, this is probably a new record of attendance to the Cancer Center Grand Rounds. So we have uh, many questions for all speakers. Uh, I'm gonna ask, start with one question for Mike Eisen. Uh, there, is, uh, there is evidence that uh, ACE inhibitors and uh, agiontensin receptor blockers increase the expression of the receptor for COVID-ACE2. 
Are there any data right now to suggest this continuation in high risk uh, populations of these uh, antihypertensive drugs? What would you recommend? So the current guidelines with regard to the medications, and that's pretty well now supported with, with some observational data, um, is if the patient is on the medications to continue them. Um, uh, there was a relatively large uh, study that uh, came out relatively recently um, that, that actually showed a protective benefit to uh, patients that were on ACE inhibitors or ARBs um, in terms of uh, outcomes. Uh, whether or not the, there's a role for antibody blocking uh, or, uh, or antigens that block the ACE receptor, um, uh, I think that that still needs to be studied and there's a lot of uh, effort moving forward to, to look at that. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is for Mike uh, Angaroni, actually. Uh, is, is, is there any evidence that immunotherapy for cancer make, uh, can make COVID-19 worse? Uh, like uh, checkpoint inhibitors, is there anything there? So we haven't. Um, there's 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 not a lot of uh, uh, evidence looking at the specific therapies, um, like the checkpoint inhibitors um, that may enhance some of that immune response or may promote that inflammatory response. Um, obviously, we're worried about that, um, and so that's why I think the global response is to just try to. Um, decrease or modify or change any of the therapies that patients are on. Um, there are interesting observations with, um, I think, the Janus kinase uh, uh, medications, um, uh, and I know Leo Gordon's working uh, with a group to kind of look at those, that they may actually blunt some of that uh, inflammatory response that individuals have. And so I think it's, uh, it's interesting with all these different antibodies, but with the checkpoint inhibitors, um, uh, I haven't seen anything specifically that they make it worse or they change the outcome. Um, we're obviously worried about that in those individuals, but I haven't read anything specifically about those. Okay. Uh, another question that came is, um, there has been some mention, uh, I think it's more anecdotal, that people who have had TB vaccination may have better resistance to the virus, resistance to the virus. Is that true? Uh, to any of the speakers? So, Mike, do you want to take it? Uh, again, Mike Angroni, if you want to answer, go ahead. Yeah, I, I've heard that too, and it's, it's a lot of observational. I think there was a mapping study I can't remember if it was from Michigan or somewhere on the East Coast that, uh, <laughs> where they uh, tried to look at that and try to correlate that. I think the difficulty is, is a lot of the countries that have recommended uh, um, BCG vaccinations, it's hard to know their numbers of cases. And this was early on in the pandemic and now those countries are starting to see increases. And so I don't really know how that's really gonna pan out and if that's really gonna be uh, real. Mike, if you wanna add anything to that. Yeah, I, I think the other thing too is, is that it's very muddy data just because someone got a vaccine, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, I'm not sure how much benefit it still would be providing uh, to, to a patient, especially if you're uh, claiming that it's uh, modulating the entire response to, uh, uh, risk to viruses, uh, for example. Um, so again, I think like a lot of things, there's been a lot of enthusiasm uh, because of small reports. Uh, I think we need prospective uh, data collection to really, uh, before we start recommending it. Okay. So another question is, um, uh, what, what is the number of tests that our city and state needs to get on a daily basis so we are good to go to uh, reactivate everything? And when do you think, if there is any guess, when do you think we will get there? Yeah. For so there's a lot of debate about what's the optimal uh, number of tests that need to be done. Uh, and again, depending on modeling data, it, it uh, ranges from uh, a couple thousand uh, uh, per day to millions per day. Uh, uh, I think the biggest thing I can say is we're not doing enough. It's not easy to get testing. Um, as we've learned, you know, just to get patients treated taken a lot of effort uh, and we're still constrained. So, uh, uh, you know, I think we have a long way to go before we have the capacity that we need and, and compared to other countries that are testing everyone, uh, you know, proposals have been 
two percent of the the country per month. That's a tiny proportion of the the population. Especially recognizing um, you're going to have to retest other people because just because you have a negative test doesn't mean you can't become infected tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, you know, it is interesting because yesterday there was the director of uh, the cancer center at Stanford uh, had a tweet where he said that uh, they tested 10,000 healthcare workers at Stanford and they had a, a rate of only about 4% infection. Are there any plans for us, any plans to do that here or do we have any idea of what percent of the healthcare workers are infected? So that there, there's a whole working group uh, looking at antibody testing, uh, and there are thoughts of uh, doing some broad uh, testing of the uh, healthcare population. Um, there, there's a lot of uh, questions and logistics that have to uh, be worked on before that's uh, rolled out. Um, I, I do think it, it is helpful. Uh, the, I think the caveat that I always uh, mention when we're talking about antibody testing, it's a snapshot that reflects uh, past exposure. Um, so just because you're negative today doesn't mean that you'll be negative in August. Um, and so, uh, you know, again, all of these things uh, need to be uh, thought about. Additionally, um, uh, there's still a lot of questions about the antibody testing. What proportion of the uh, uh, antibodies that are detected are neutralizing antibodies, those antibodies that are protective against infection? How long do they persist? Again, just because you're positive today doesn't mean you're protected uh, six months from now. Um, so there, there's a lot of questions that uh, still remain. And I think at least getting a snapshot is helpful, but uh, understanding what we do with that information, I think, is far more complex. Thank you. Uh, one other question that came is um, whether we have a clear understanding of how long the virus lives on various surfaces. Anybody can take that. Sure. There, there's been a lot of studies that have looked at, at this, and, and uh, while I am, uh, the, some of the studies have looked at whether or not this is an aerosolizable uh, virus, uh, I think it takes a lot more uh, to understand whether or not that's uh, meaningful for clinical practices. Uh, there there are, are several studies that have looked at different surfaces, different uh, environmental conditions uh, that uh, uh, lead to uh, how long a uh, uh, the virus is uh, stable. Um, I'll, I'll uh, I can send some information around. Uh, I don't re recall off the top of my head for each yeah. surface, but uh, uh, in general, for most surfaces, it doesn't last for a very long time. These are lipid uh, uh, enveloped viruses, and so as they dry out, they rank and uh, decrease their infect uh, infectiousness relatively quickly. So uh, things like cardboard that uh, would dry them up a little bit faster uh, uh, should uh, uh, have less infectiousness than kind of smooth surfaces that don't have antimicrobial effects. Got it. Uh, one other question was, um, um, if there is an explanation from for, uh, for some data coming out of New York City that patients on biologics for rheumatoid arthritis or other autoimmune diseases do as well as the general population uh, with the disease, uh, you know, like everyone, is there anything in common there on that? Um, so, I, you know, I think that what we're finding is that there are two components of the disease. There's the uh, uh, virus itself, the, the replication which causes the disease, and then the uh, uh, inflammatory response to the virus, which causes uh, contributes significantly to the severity of the disease. Um, so number one, uh, I think we need uh, better data that uh, looks at patients longitudinally uh, to, to see about the uh, efficacy. I will uh, caution people uh, when we looked at initial data uh, of solid organ transplantation, for example, it looked like they uh, did better than the uh, general population. But now that we have larger pools of data uh, that have been followed out a, lot, a little bit longer, uh, we see that they uh, do at least uh, the same, if not a little worse than the, the general population. So again, like everything, the data is moving very quickly. Uh, there's theories about why they may do a little bit better, but we need to get large pools of uh, data longitudinally over time. Uh, I want to be respectful of time, but we keep getting questions. Uh, I'm going to do a, two or three more questions and then we'll stop. So one question is, uh, and I think this was mentioned earlier, but does the detection of viral RNA in patients who had uh, recovered uh, from COVID, the persistence of viral particles, translates to in infectivity? 
or can RNA fragments just remain there and not be infectious? Yeah, so, so there, there's two, uh, I think, uh, questions that uh, uh, come up uh, with this. Number one, are, are, is the virus that we're detecting or the RNA that we're detecting uh, representative of uh, replication competent uh, virus? And so we have a, a bunch of different data that suggests that it probably is. Number one, we have RNAs and DNAs in our nasal secretions. And so RNA should be degraded relatively uh, quickly if it's not from a replicating virus. Two, for almost every uh, virus that's been studied, uh, particularly in this patient population, um, when they've done uh, sophisticated studies looking for things like capped mRNA, which suggests replicating virus, they're able to correlate the detection of that with the, the ongoing detection of uh, the, the virus. Uh, and then, um, uh, the, the, uh, then, then we get to the question of infectiousness. Oh, sorry, the, the third thing I was going to say is, again, if you look at the uh, paper that uh, came out in Nature and uh, the uh, other one that came out uh, uh, last week in, in The Lancet looking at uh, uh, replication, there was evidence of uh, differential mutations in upper and lower respiratory tract, again, suggesting that this is uh, viral replication that is ongoing. Um, the question of infectiousness, uh, really the only way to know is to, to look at uh, whether or not you can detect culturable virus. Uh, and again, in the, the biggest study that's looked at this, the limit of detection of that was 10 to the 6th, which is pretty high uh, for most other respiratory viruses where it would be normal. 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4. Uh, and then secondly, uh, you have to look clinically, uh, you know, can you see transmissions from those patients with uh, low-level replication? We just don't have that data yet. So in terms of uh, the infectivity of patients who recover from COVID, what, what is the predicted range based on the presence of uh, uh, viral particles? So I don't know that we have a, a definite answer to that. I think that the problem that we have is you have patients where we can document ongoing replication and they're uh, being uh, going to places where other patients that are at high risk uh, for uh, acquiring infections. And what we know is that our immunosuppressed patients are canaries in the coal mine and that lower inoculum can uh, result in infection and that they may, as Mike showed, have uh, slightly worse outcomes if they get infection. And so uh, I think that, you know, my, my thought for this patient population always is, is that uh, we just have to be extra cautious, but we also, as Mary raised uh, in her comments, uh, 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 begin thinking about how do we continue some of the care for our patients in ways that we can uh, continue that care and providing it uh, in a safe way. Okay, uh, and one more question now is about children. Um, is there any explanation on why children have uh, lower rates of COVID-19 and whether this is related in any way to other immunizations they get? Anyone? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I, I defer to Mike being more of the respiratory virus uh, expert. Um, you know, talking to some of the our Pete's colleagues at Lurie, they are seeing cases of this. So it is kind of interesting. They are seeing cases typically in the older children and then in the like late teens, they're getting really sick. But um, I think everyone's really working on why is it that kids when they do get it have more of a milder Illness. Mike, I don't know if you if you know or you're aware of any reason why that would be. Uh, yeah, that, that I don't know. Um, uh, would, I know that I saw one of the, the uh, Bill Mueller on there. He might be able to text something in on the text box. Yeah. Okay, and that's the final question because we need to stay on time. So the question is about the COVID-19 test used. What, just if someone can review the tests that are used at Northwestern and the community, and what is the reliability of the uh, various tests? And uh, do we have, and whether do we have any guidelines uh, for re-entry? Uh, for instance, once someone asked if the ABO test used is a reliable result to define uh, what we do next. Mike. So we have, um, here we use uh, our own PCR um, that we built in house. Uh, but most commonly, we use the Cepheid test uh, and the Abbott uh, ID now, or the Allier, I think it's the Allier ID now test um, that are being most commonly used. Um, those tests have rapid turnaround times. The Allier test has about an hour, hour and a half. 
turnaround time, the, the Cepheid is uh, probably about two or three hours that we've seen. Um, there are some questions about the clinical sensitivity of the Allier test. Um, I think when you're looking at that test and doing it in people that are known to be positive, um, I don't think we have to worry as much about the uh, lack of sensitivity uh, or the potential false negatives as much as we do um, in patients that are just generally being screened. Um, uh, so I do think you know we are worried about the the possibility of false negatives. That's why we're doing for the follow-up testing at least the two negatives. Um, being in the hospital and, and Mike and I have both uh, on our on the transplant side, but also working with uh, patients on the COVID units and potential COVID units, um, those that we have a really high suspicion for, we actually are doing repeat testing if they are negative on their initial test. Um, we've had small numbers of clinical COVID, uh, um, but on the repeat test, uh, if they have a really high suspicion, um, we've had a few that have shown up positive, not many. Um, and so I think our tests are becoming more reliable as we uh, are really targeting our testing. I think as you start testing everyone, then we worry about the false negative rate much more. So I think that's why that follow-up testing, uh, to me, I think that those are gonna be tests that we can rely on the results that they present. Okay, so I wanna thank our speakers for really great uh, Cancer Center Grand Grounds. Thank you again for being here. We very much appreciate your time and thank everyone for participating in this round. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, thanks, have a good day.